Well, my body lies over the ocean. My body lies over the sea. My body lies over the ocean. Oh, bring back my body to me. Scott Arizala Show presented by CampHacker.org. My name is Travis Allison. Uh, today we're going to be talking with Scott about difficult management decisions. Hey Scott, how's it going? Hi Travis, thanks so much. Uh, I am really excited about this uh, particular episode. We are going to be talking a little bit about difficult management conversations uh, and sort of the, the ideas behind, you know, how to how to handle, you know, these kind of moments. I've as a camp director, I have had so many uh, awkward, hard, difficult conversations. Uh, it was about three or four years ago uh, that I sort of struggled through a particular conversation that I want to share with you. And uh, it was out of that uh, came a lot of the stuff we're going to talk about today. Because I came away from that, uh, I made some pretty significant mistakes in that conversation, or in the, in the sort of lead up to the conversation, uh, and I sort of s took a step back from that and really thought to myself, you know, there's got to be a better way to like think about these. And uh, through some work that I did on my own, and then developing this stuff, and then having some different conversations uh, with folks, I, I realized that there's there's kind of a structure to these, uh, you know, anybody, any supervisor, any director out there knows that every single sort of difficult management moment uh, is really different. It, it, it's really different from moment to moment and they never sort of go the way that you rehearsed it in your head or you think, but there is a structure that we can follow and that's kind of what I want to talk about today. Uh, the story I want to uh, start with and tell you guys is about a, um, a conversation or a, a bunch of the conversations I had with a, uh, a staff member of mine uh, a few years ago, uh, basically uh, during uh, staff training during our, uh, when we were taking all of our staff for uh, their swim tests, um, she made a comment that uh, black people can't float. And she basically said that uh, as this sort of fact that she learned in biology. Uh, my particular camp is uh, about half African American as far as our staff uh, and our kids are, are maybe even a higher percentage than that. Uh, and so there was a lot of black people around who were pretty much like, what are you talking about? Like, we, I can float. Uh, she went on to talk about how black people's bones are denser, I mean just some really ignorant, you know, sort of, sort of comment. And, uh, to, to everyone's sort of surprise, right? And and I just, you know, pretty much flew off the handle. I, I was ready to fire her, you know, basically instantly. And uh, the other director, kind of everybody you kind know, of talked me off the ledge just a little bit. And her, actually, her unit leader was the one that said, Scott, I want to I wanna be able to handle this. And, and the unit leader uh, was also African-American. And, and uh, I, so I thought, wow, you know, okay, you know, go for it. Just like, you know, don't kill her. And she was like, no, 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 no. I just want to have this conversation with her. So it's fine. They had this conversation and, and uh, uh, you know, this woman sort of like, like acknowledged that, uh, or no, no, she didn't acknowledge that what she said was wrong per se. She, you know, did one of these non-apology apologies, which was like, I'm sorry you're offended by that, by that, so I won't say it again, kind of apology. I wasn't necessarily satisfied with that, but everybody else was, and this unit leader really wanted to work with her and, and whatever, so I said, all right, you know, as long as it's all sorted out. I think I might have made a couple of mistakes there as well, but it was, you know, whatever. Um, about a week later, two weeks later, we actually had kids there. Uh, this particular woman was at the pool. There was a kid, uh, a black kid, in the pool trying to learn how to float, no less, like at this moment, trying to like actually learn how to do it. And she makes the same comment uh, to the kid, uh, and the staff member was standing there, you know, trying to like help this kid learn how to float and everything. As soon as I heard this, I literally, I was like done with this person. Um, so instead of like calming down, going and having like a rational conversation, using some of the techniques we're about to talk about now, uh, I basically flew off the handle and uh, I was ready to go down and just, you know, yelling and screaming and fire her in front of everybody and basically do all the like the not best practices that we all talk about. 
the other directors, a couple people stopped me, um, and I basically said, okay, fine, you know, we'll, we'll quote, do it your way. Um, so I had a, a director go get uh, this, this counselor, and they, they were going to bring her up to the office. Well, it just so happens that that day at camp, the, um, the executive director was there, as well as the, uh, the, the chair of our board. Um, so what I did is I, as I uh, set up um, a, one of the classrooms that's across from our hall, uh, and I had the executive director come in, the assistant director, myself, and the chair of our board, I sat everybody in that room and I sat them on one side of a table and put a lone chair on the other side of the table. And when the, when the director brought the counselor in, she like sat down across the table from like the four of us. And, it was in that moment when I saw it in her face that I realized I had gone like so far overboard. Um, you know, I was I was pretty much like emotionally kind of out of control. Uh, it was from this sort of myriad of experiences that I stepped back and I said, you know, there's got to be a better way to handle these kinds of things. There's got to be a more metered, more measured frankly a more productive effective approach to having what can be a really hard conversation whether that conversation is I'm sorry you're fired you know this is what happened it's 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 you know uh, you've broken these policies or uh, you know look, look I'm concerned about this choice that you made or anywhere in between we've got to have a, sort of a better way, uh, a, a, an outline to follow, a structure to follow, to be able to be productive uh, in, these, in these conversations. So you set something up with your staff, Scott, that they have some tools to deal with it and they know how you're going to deal with the situation? Sort of, yeah. I mean, I, I, what I did is I sort of tried to create a, a flow of what, of what exactly you know, needs to happen. And, and there's some big ideas, and this is how I train my, my person, you know, my unit leaders, my staff, as well as other, other camps that I go to. This is one of the things that I say all the time, uh, is there's, there's some sort of big ideas first and foremost, and this comes directly from, you know, my experience. The first is you gotta be calm. Uh, you know, there's no, it really does not, you know, in my opinion now, it, it doesn't really matter what's happened. Um, and we can talk about some of the, you know, the most um, fireable offenses out there and it's still, you need to be calm when you're approaching this particular situation. A lot of times I talk to staff about dealing with kids and their behavior and one of the things I say all the time is, look, your emotions, your feelings about the situation isn't going to help. Like you sort of flying off the handle and yelling and screaming and slamming doors and pounding your fist on the table about how pissed off you are. That's not necessarily going to help this kid learn that what they did is wrong. The same is true if you're talking about a 17-year-old staff member, a 20-year-old staff member, a 25-year-old staff member who uh, broke some policy and now needs to get fired. That the same is true. You flying off the handle and being pissed off doesn't really help. Me getting so upset and like marching around screaming how, you know, uh, this person is racist and I can't have a racist on my staff and they, you know, she needs to be fired and, um, you know, she's like a bad person and all these things that I was saying may all be true, but that emotion isn't going to help. So being calm going sort of at the out, out, outset of some of these conversations is really important. The second piece, and this is really hard and we also train, we also uh, teach our young people how to do this with kids, but this is really hard. We have to listen very carefully when we're having these conversations. We have to understand that what we know is, is just from our perspective, right? We may not have the sort of whole quote unquote truth, and I put truth in quotes because we all know that truth is really relative and perspective is, is really relative. Uh, we really gotta think about being calm, listen caref listening very carefully, uh, and understanding that there might be some really different perspectives out there. So those are sort of the big ideas before we get into this, this outline of the structure. One of the best things about my camp director experience, experiences was working with Beth. And I think anybody can um, have the same thing, even if they are the lone director at the top. And for us, we are often, most often, opposite in our anger. 
And so the one person could be the calming influence and just say, okay, we're just going to talk this through, um, go about it calmly, figure out a way to deal with this without this much anger. And then in other situations, that it would just be reversed. And the other one of us would be the angry one. And the other one would be the one saying, okay, we'll just take it easy um, and, uh, and work through it. And having that was amazing. And I think even as a, a solo camp director, you could have or find somebody on your senior staff who could be that calming influence for you. And then hopefully you could tag team and switch that when um, that other person was really upset, you could be the one who calmed things down and, and help bring that situation to a, to a good solution. Oh, absolutely. I, I couldn't agree more, Travis. And, and on top of it, not only do I agree with that idea that you need to sort of self-regulate enough, you need to be self-aware enough to know, hey, this is making me crazy and I, my emotions are really high about this, right? And you need to be a really great role model for the rest of your, your middle management, your staff, everybody else. What's the one of the, what's one of the one what, what's one of the top things that makes us all as camp directors crazy about our young people is what, is that they never ask for help right is that we tell them from the beginning ask for help ask for help it's not a strength it's a we you know, it's not a weakness it's a strength blah 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 none of them ever ask for help one of the reasons is that they don't have any role models they, they've never seen anybody do it right perfect perfect time for you to say hey you know what. I'm not necessarily going to be the best one to handle this right now. Can you come over here and help me? Sounds like you and Beth Charles had that had that kind of relationship. I would uh, I would highly suggest that uh, you are able to create that relationship with other senior staff members, others of your uh, directing team, uh, regardless of whether you are the the top um, you know director, or, you know the the sort of where the buck stops or not. Now, all of us need help, and all of us need to be able to sort of have a, a, a metered approach at times. Well, Scott, what's involved in that listening to that other person and, and hearing the other side of the story? Well, I think this is where we really get into like, okay, so, so what is this outline? Like, what are we supposed to do, right? And I think, you know, there, there's a couple of things that we need to, uh, there's a handful of things that we need to do, and they, they don't necessarily always go in this sort of clean order, but I think, Travis, your question sort of speaks directly to this. How do we give them an opportunity to sort of talk what, about what their perspective is, what, what their sort of truth about this is? I mean, I think, you know, we do all the things that we, that we, we need to do to, to make this a, a, an acceptable situation. And what I mean by that is we, we don't have difficult management conversations in front of kids. We don't do it in front of other staff. We don't um, you know, pull them away uh, from a situation where they're the only ones supervising kids. You know, all those things it's sort of, I'm, I'm sort of assuming is gonna happen, right? We pull them away. We take them in, 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 in sort of a, a, a more secluded place, like away from kids, away, away from staff. Uh, Having said that, uh, almost all the time I would suggest you having any kind of difficult management conversation with another member of your leadership team there uh, so that it's not just a one-on-one -on -one conversation. That's, that's not always possible, but when it is, and, and it's not always appropriate, but when it is, make sure that you're doing that. Uh, and then the first thing that you need to do is just be very clear. You know, uh, a lot of us, when we get into these situations, we we feel weird. We feel awkward. We're about to say something to somebody that they know they're going to, they know, we know that they're going to react too poorly, right? So you've got to like, okay, you know, so what do a lot of us do? Uh, kind of dance around. We go, oh, well, you know, this, you do this really well, but I want to talk about this thing over here. You know, I'm not a big fan of, you know, praise sandwiches and all this kind of stuff. I mean, if you have something difficult to talk about with somebody and you've taken the opportunity to go up to them and say, hey, can I have some of your time? And you've brought, you've brought them sort of aside, and just have out with it. Just say it, whatever it is, okay? Say, you know, okay, here's what I've been hearing. This is what I've noticed. Uh, these things have come up. Uh, you know, whatever that sort of framework ar around what you think you know to be the facts, quote unquote, right? Uh, and sometimes it's stuff that you've seen, sometimes it's stuff you've heard, uh, sometimes it's, it's, you know, sort of things that you think might be going on, whatever it is, frame it like that and just say what it is. Put it out there, say, this is what's going on. Then the sort of next step is to give them that space and say, tell me about this, right? Ask some really good open-ended questions about it, right? Like, 
the last three, you know, nights in a row, uh, you've come in late for curfew. I know that because for the last two nights I've been there, and the night before that, the person who was on, you know, circle duty told me you were late. So what's going on there? Tell me about it, right? Like, tell me why, what, what's happening. Give them an opportunity to talk to you about it, right? That's where you're really having to sort of sit back and listen, all right? Now, we all kind of know what happens in that particular moment, right? Depending on the maturity and uh, sometimes the age, sometimes the experience, um, sometimes the situation, uh, what do we hear in that moment? Well, we either hear a lot of excuses um, about, well, I had to be late because of this or that, or denials oftentimes. I wasn't late. What do you mean? I, you know, I was right on time, blah, blah, blah. You know, same thing that happens with kids, right? I mean, just as an FYI, the same thing, right? When kids are like, I didn't do it. It wasn't me. I didn't know I was supposed to do that. They made me do it, whatever, right? I mean, we hear that kind of stuff all the time. So, as a supervisor and a director, you're having this difficult management conversation. You say like what the issue is, what the problem is. You ask them about their reality for it. They sort of give you a bunch of that. You ask some follow-up questions. You have them sort of draw it out a little bit more. The next step is really to talk about what the behavior change needs to be. Right now, for any of you out there paying attention to what I'm saying, there's typically people trying to call me out about the disconnect between the sort of second and third step that I'm outlining here. Because I say, you know, you need to tell them, what, tell them what the problem is, you need to give them some space to talk about it, then you need to talk about a behavior change. But oftentimes those two things don't match up, right? Because if they're like denying that it even happened, or if they're giving you all these reasons why it's okay that it happened, and then you go right into, well, I need you to be on time or early from now on for curfew or whatever it is, the behavior change that you want to see happen, it seems like you weren't even listening. It seems like you just weren't even paying attention to what they said because you're like, yeah, 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 and I need you to just be on time, okay? Do you understand? So the technique that I've always used that I think is a really, it's a really powerful technique is to is to not deny what their sort of feelings or their perspective is about it. In fact, I always affirm that, that perspective. Um, if people are giving me all sorts of excuses about why something has happened, I oftentimes will say, okay, well, it sounds like you've thought through this. It sounds like you have a lot of reasons, and whether they're good reasons or not, I don't comment on it. I say, it sounds like you have a lot of reasons why this went down. And the perspective out there exists that in your unit and with the other counselors that you don't carry your weight or that you're always late or that uh, you yell a lot at the kids when, when it really is that when they're really not doing anything wrong or whatever the problem is right and you just sort of restate the problem but in this idea that it's just another perspective that exists out there like I, I understand what you're saying I hear what you're saying right and not I wasn't there so I'm not even like Trying to trying to deny or or, or 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 devalidate what you're saying, okay? And there's this whole other issue out there. There's this whole other perspective of it. Now the reality is, I can't do anything to change the perspective, and that perspective is important because it, it hurts the community. It hurts what's happening, right? It's making your job harder. It's making your co co counselor's job harder. So what are you going to do to sort of change this perspective? If everybody else thinks that you're always late. And I, I've been there, I've seen you sign in late, yet you have all these good reasons. What are you going to do differently to change this perspective? Now, all of a sudden, they may not agree with it. They may not like that this perspective is out there. But because you've been respectful, you've listened to it, they can't necessarily argue that that perspective isn't real or doesn't exist. And they certainly... Uh, you know, I have to understand, I mean, everyone has to understand that, that you or everybody else can't do anything about it. If you are in a situation with a difficult management conversation where you kind of get to this space of, well, everybody else needs to change, everybody is wrong, everybody doesn't understand me, my opinion would be the emotions are still kind of running too high for you to be productive in this conversation. Most people won't go there. Most people in a calm conversation will say, okay, well, I have all these reasons, and it's not fair that people think of this about me or that this perspective exists, 
So what can I do now to change that perspective of me? That's a really common place for people to be. And that's of course the next step. Like what are your goals? Like what are, what's the method? What are you going to do to change that behavior? Then of course you as the, as the director, the supervisor need to follow up and make sure that that happens. This is generally the flow I think of, of, and there's a lot of different pieces in there, but that's the sort of general flow of when there's something really difficult that you need to manage or, or handle, what are some of the steps to take to make sure that that conversation gets handled the right way. Three Adventures International Camp Staff. Three things you should know about Three Adventures. One, our owners are all former camp directors. Two, we're a high quality company that's easy on your budget. Three, background checks. Our international camp staff come from all over the world and every one of them has had a background check. No exceptions, no excuses. 3adventures.com, the site to get great camps connected with great staff. Yeah, I like that, uh, that bit about changing perspective because when I'm in that situation, I'm frustrated with the staff member. Naturally, I want to jump to, I want to solve this. But to do that well, I need to have that person be on board with the solution. You, you need that buy-in that it's a problem, right? I mean, this becomes particularly interesting, and we've all been there in a situation with co-counselors. Day camp, resident camp, doesn't matter. We've all been there in a situation with co-counselors where it's basically they don't get along. They don't like each other. Basically, like, you know, I've been there so many times. Every camp director has been there where you're basically sitting in this conversation. you got to kind of explain to somebody that, yeah, it's kind of your personality. Yeah, you, you know, people kind of just, like, don't like you. I mean, that's, like, oh, I, that's such a weird thing to have to say to people, right? It's such a hard, you know, space to have to be in where it's like, yeah, you kind of just, like, don't get along. And, you know, and so, again, that buy-in that this is an actual problem is hard in that space. So how do you do it well? You know, you talk about how there's different perspectives, right? You know, I had a situation two years ago, maybe last year, where um, one person, um, my staff live in what basically like dorm rooms, and one person was just, I mean, like, you know, messy. And I mean, messy to like the ninth degree, you know, like nasty messy. And um, but she just she just didn't see it like that. Uh, that's just like how she lives or whatever. But, you know, of course, her roommate was like, I can't live like this. And, uh, you know, so having that conversation, we just, you know, I had to sort of talk about how, you know, well, from her perspective, like, do you see what she does with her stuff? Like she, all of her stuff is in her drawers, right? Like all, none of your stuff is in the drawers, you know, whatever. So we, you know, I had to change that perspective to get buy-in on, on that this is a problem that we need to do something about. And do you find that the easiest way for them to change perspective is to see an outsider's perspective on their behavior? Well, I think so. I think so. I think I, it's a combination of a couple of things. One, I think it's like, again, showing them that respect and, and that uh, affirmation that their perspective is legitimate and real. And I'm not trying to take that away from you. Of course, that's how you feel. And that's fine. And there's this whole other perspective out there that's just as legitimate and just as real. Uh, and so we've got to kind of come to some sort of compromise in between. Uh, and, and I think that's a real powerful way to do it. A lot of times I think what people hear when there's a, dis, when there's a disagreement or we see things differently is I think a lot of people, especially younger people, feel like, well, one is right and one is wrong. And that might actually be true, by the way, that, that one perspective is actually wrong uh, and another perspective is, is right. I, I'm just, I don't think that psychologically that that's very, that's a very effective way to come at somebody and say, how you handle yourself or who you are or what you think is wrong, change it to this other thing, right? I've never found that to be a really effective strategy. So I think, you know, if we can combine the, hey, you know, your feelings are, are just as real for you as my feelings are for me or this other person's feelings are for them. So we have to respect that as well as I'm trying to respect what you're, where you're coming from. I think it's easier to have this, this flow, this conversation. When I think back on my own experiences, Scott, when I was 21, I led a seven week LAT program and, um, 
my co-counselor and I just didn't click. We, before this, we'd been sort of casual camp friends and and um, had attended a camp at the same time, but not really got to know each other, but were put in the situation to co-lead this LIT program. And I made her cry every day. And um, I think the lessons from what you're saying, obviously I handled this poorly because my solution for the problem was you just need to get over this. But if I had applied some of these things that you said, I think we could have worked things out a lot better and had a better experience. And I didn't make her cry because of something specific I'd done to her. It was just my actions somehow affected her in such a strong way that um, that she just cried all the time. And, and I think that I could have handled it much better than I did. Yeah. You know, and it, it can be really hard, right? Because people really, I mean, people have really strong feelings about things. You know, one of the things that I talk a lot about, and we'll just frame this around working with kids, is um, uh, when there's like a, uh, and again, since, you know, I sort of started by using a, a, a sort of a race example, um, you know, talking to kids who have used a racist, uh, a racist comment. All right, and like, how do you handle that? And I always get this question from young people, and they say, "Well, what if they say to you when you're working with them that that's just what they believe, and that that's the kind of family you know their their family says that that's okay?" And you know, my advice always is this: Well, okay, fine. I mean, you can't you can't really say that 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 they're wrong. And you should see people react to me when I say this. I mean, it's like, well, yeah, you can, because they are wrong. That's not right to say. That's not right for their family to teach them that. And it's like, well, of course I agree with that statement, right? Like, of course it's not right, right? But what are you really, you really going to look at a 12-year-old and be like, well, you're wrong, and what your family has taught you is wrong, and this is the right way to be. That's not effective, right? So what I try to teach is to say, okay, well, I'm not here to judge or to say like what's right and what's wrong in your family. My job and what my responsibility is to say how we act to each other here at camp. And here at camp, that's unacceptable because that's exclusive language, it's hurtful language, none of those things are okay. It's not respectful, so if that's how you believe or what you believe, if that's what your parents have taught you or whatever, I may disagree with that. But that's about you and your family and whatever. I'm saying how we have to act to, to each other here, right? That's different. It's more, it's, it's more effective because it gives kids a, a, an actual thing to go and do. They're not just wrong now, which of course we would say that they are, but they're not just wrong. They have now something to do differently because of it. Back to it's the same thing as I mean, you know, obviously, you know, what your your example is a little less high stakes, I think. But you know, somebody crying for seven, you know, for every single day for seven weeks, and you literally want to just shake them and say, "Get over it," right? You know, it's like, well, it's not really effective, you know, to say, "Okay, well, what?" You know, obviously, what I'm doing is like really affecting you. Like, what what can I do differently to help you? you know, sort of manage this or like what's going on with you? What would you like to see differently from me or whatever? Yeah, that's, that's awesome. Uh, do you have any final thoughts on difficult management situations, Scott? I mean, you know, sort of, I'm going to sort of start or end where I started um, by basically saying, look, you know, with difficult management conversations, they're always awkward. They're never easy. They always come out off different um, there is no like way to do every single conversation and uh, any director or supervisor who says differently, you know, I, I don't know. I, I don't believe them. Uh, you know, I, I've definitely met directors who are like, oh, it's easy for me to fire people. I mean, maybe, but the reality is, is that every single conversation like this is difficult and it, it's awkward and it feels weird. I think the power behind having stuff like this is to say, okay, we have some ideas to, to uh, of what direction this needs to go in, and uh, this will per effectively get us to some resolution. What that resolution is, is is sort of dependent on the situation. You know, my last piece of advice for anybody would be sort of to talk about what, what we were saying earlier about finding the support system at your camp. Even if you're, you know, the, the, the boss, the camp director, the executive director, whatever, you need to find your 
support system as well. So the people that you can talk to, the support that you can have, you know, the person that you can review what's going to happen or preview what's going to happen before you go have this conversation, as well as the person you can like review the conversation with after it's done and say, what do you think? You know, should I try and rehab it or so on and so forth? So that's kind of uh, uh, where I would close. It also strikes me, Scott, that using this method will help um, shorten those difficult, the difficult conversations. And that I, that is is huge, right? A lot of times we'll find ourselves in long, drawn out, hours on end kind of conversations. Following something like this gives you the next step, gives you the place to go, and it's it's sort of um, finite, meaning that you know we can only kind of go through it and sort of uh, rework it so many times before we're really going to move on to the next step of, well, what are we going to do differently? Or how can I follow up with you? Or when should I check in with you? Done, right? So absolutely, I think this this can shorten the conversations and make them more concise as well. Well, thanks very much for sharing that, Scott. We really do appreciate your insight into this. For those of you listening, my name is Travis Allison. We appreciate you checking out the Scott Arizella show on camphacker.org. Um, Scott, where can people find out more about you? Thank you, Travis. Uh, if you want to find out more about what I do, please visit my website at thecampcounselor.com. Uh, thanks again for tuning in, everybody, and we'll see you next time. Well, my body.